Hello and welcome back to our continued look at the respiratory system. Um, this uh, slide should look familiar. This is where we left off uh, before we had this unfortunate little uh, snafu with the coronavirus. And so uh, we're going to pick right up here uh, with the information on the respiratory system. And uh, my goal is to create 20, 25 minute length of videos uh, on the remainder of the material that we have within the course. And so, uh, again, we're going to try to chunk this material to make it as manageable as we can and as interactive as we can and uh, see that you guys are successful. Uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, this will be one of the videos that I will re-record <laughs> since we're going through all of this uh, in the near future uh, as part of me revamping all of my PowerPoints. Um, so uh, you guys are my guinea pigs for AMP2. Uh, again, I welcome the feedback and the suggestions and anything else that you may have for us. <laughs> and thank you very much, Professor Pringle, making an appearance on the video. Um, in case you did not hear it, I will not have her repeat it, um, but uh, we appreciate the humor. <laughs> and um, for the record, um, I do have a drink in my hand as I am recording this, so uh, I am staying true to my word and uh, making sure that you guys are uh, well taken care of. So with that said, uh, let's go into the respiratory system. I am going to start the timer so that way I know not to go dramatically over my 20 to 25 minutes. Um, by the way, uh, before I do start that, that timer, um, I'm going to embed questions throughout the videos as well. So you'll come to a certain point and the video will stop and you will be forced to answer some review questions. And that does count as a grade. Uh, you don't know when they're going to pop up in the video. Uh, they're not all at the end. They are scattered throughout. So you have to pay attention to the video as you go through to be able to answer those questions. So uh, do not be alarmed by the fact that we're going to have videos popping up uh, or I'm sorry, questions popping up through the video. So without further delay, uh, let me go ahead and start my timer and see where we uh, where we go with this. Again, 20 to 25 minutes is my goal. If I run over, I apologize. Um, if I'm done early, it's just like lecture. It's a rare occurrence, but I, I may get through it a little early. And so the video will be a little bit shorter. All right, let's start this. So uh, on the next slide uh, is actually a slide of a video animation. Um, I have reposted the slides for the, um, uh, the, the picture slides to include this slide at the very end, as well as the second animation slide. Um, and just to kind of show, well, I don't want to interrupt the PowerPoint right now, but when you click on this, uh, this will bring you into a website uh, that will kind of review with you exactly how the, uh, pulmonary ventilation occurs. Again, how air is moving into the lungs and how air is being forced out of the lungs. Um, if this was uh, systemic um, or tissue ventilation, this would be what would be happening at the level of the tissues, what we often refer to as systemic ventilation. Um, but this video here is on pulmonary ventilation. And so let's go ahead and uh, we'll pick back up with our look at um, how exactly um, oxygen is transported throughout our circulatory system. Um, and so uh, we have hemoglobin. We know hemoglobin is the major carrier of oxygen. Uh, we know that uh, hemoglobin is made up of uh, four um, globular tertiary chains. Uh, and those four uh, tertiary globular chains come together to form this quaternary structure of proteins. Uh, two alpha chains and two beta chains, um, or two alpha proteins and two beta proteins, um, for which you can uh, see being present right there. And give me one second. 
And so again, you can see here's one chain there, here's another chain, there's the one chain, and there's one chain. But more importantly, what I want to draw your attention to is that on each of these chains, so right there, right there, hiding back here, and hiding right there, you see that we have a heme group. Right? And at the center of each of those heme groups, at the center of each of those heme groups, So point to it right there. Again, at the center of each of those heme groups, there is a uh, molecule of iron, right, Fe plus. And the purpose of that iron molecule um, is to bind to the oxygen. And so that is where the oxygen is binding to. Um, 98% of the body's oxygen is going to bind to that hemoglobin. The other 2% gets um, uh, lost or absorbed within the plasma um, and or um, uh, never fully binds to the hemoglobin. So we're only really at ever 98% uh, full capacity, which I think we mentioned in lecture. Um, the other thing that I will mention to you is right down here, right? Uh, when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, we create this new structure that is referred to as oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin. Right? And so oxyhemoglobin is oxygen bound to hemoglobin. Now, there is this relationship um, that happens, and, and this is a this is a two-way street. So, typically, what happens here is uh, when the oxygen concentration increases, right, when the oxygen concentration increases, this equation tends to shift to the right. right? So, in other words, the this equation moves from having oxygen being separate to oxygen being bound to hemoglobin because you have excess oxygen. We don't want to waste it. We don't want to lose it. And so therefore we bind it to hemoglobin. Now, the opposite effect of this is, well, what happens when we have uh, too little O2? What happens when the oxygen O2 uh, concentration decreases? And well, when that happens, then we see the opposite effect. Uh, we see this oxyhemoglobin, now that oxygen separates off, which is what you're seeing right there. And so oxyhemoglobin uh, now becomes oxygen and hemoglobin, and that oxygen is free to go ahead and be absorbed within the tissues. And so less oxygen availability, um, that uh, the less oxygen available to bind to hemoglobin, causing hemoglobin to release the oxygen and this equation shifts back to the left. And that oxygen is now free to be absorbed by surrounding tissues. So um, at any given point in time, the amount of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin is what we refer to as the percent of saturation of hemoglobin. And we can measure, we can measure this um, percent of saturation, saturation uh, of hemoglobin in something that is referred to as the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. And I think everybody cringed in lecture when I mentioned that, um, the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. And that is the relationship between the partial pressure of oxygen and the hemoglobin how much oxygen is bound to hemoglobin at any point in time. 
And so to understand that, we have this nifty little table here, this chart here. All right. So we know that oxygen has a partial pressure. O2 has a partial pressure of 104 millimeters of mercury. Um, when we look at the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, we kind of stop this at 100 millimeters of mercury because remember, um, we're dealing with percent saturation. And so down here, down here in this corner, we stop it at 100, but understand that that's really 104 millimeters of mercury. Right? And then over here we have, of course, 100%. This is our percent saturation. Right? This is how much actual oxyhemoglobin that we have. Right. So you can see that um, the oxyhemoglobin is saturated um, at 98%. Right? 98% of the available hemoglobin is bound to oxygen. That is max. That is it. That's not going to change. All right? So 100 millimeters of mercury um, partial pressure of oxygen is going to lead to 98% uh, oxyhemoglobin efficiency. All right. By the time we get down to the tissues, this is in the alveoli, all right, this line here is saying, all right, you have a tissue, it's resting. So you got a resting cell, it's not overly producing a whole lot of uh, metabolic waste, it's not really doing cell respiration, it's not relying on insulin for glucose uptake, none of that kind of stuff is happening. And so um, the partial pressure of oxygen at the tissue level, as you remember from previous class, is 40 millimeters of mercury. Well, at that partial pressure of oxygen at 40 millimeters of mercury, if you come up on this oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, you can see that we still have 75% oxyhemoglobin. That means 75% of the available oxyhemoglobin is bound to oxygen. Right? And so that is what that is showing there. So a drop of 60 millimeters of mercury in partial pressure of oxygen, 40, I'm sorry, 100 millimeters of mercury within the alveoli down to 40 millimeters of mercury uh, down in the resting tissue. 60% difference here, you can see that we're only losing about 23% of our available oxygen. In other words, for oxygen per hemoglobin molecule, we're only losing one oxygen molecule at that point in time. All right. So uh, this hemoglobin here leaves the alveoli, travels down to the resting tissues, and it's going to unload approximately one oxygen molecule at rest. That is what this curve is. That is what this curve here is depicting. So what happens if the percent of saturation um, falls from 100 millimeters of mercury to 80 millimeters of mercury? Well, at 80 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of oxygen, our percent of saturation, our percent of saturation only drops down to about 92%. In other words, 20% difference in the partial pressure of oxygen only leads to about a um, 3 to 4% difference in the availability of oxygen to um, bind to hemoglobin. Right? Large drop, small change. All right, small change. And so you're down to about 95%. Again, you're losing 3 or 4% of that available uh, oxyhemoglobin. For a 20 millimeter of mercury drop in partial pressure of oxygen. Well, what happens if, what happens if we now drop to 60 millimeters of mercury? All right, so now we're going from 100 down to 60 millimeters of mercury. You can see that we're losing about an 8% drop. So not a big drop in the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin compared to rather large changes in the partial pressure of oxygen that is available to bind. Right. And we can continue to go down on this scale so that if you now 
there is a drop off. Once you hit that 40 millimeters of mercury, notice how steep this slope gets. Right? This is what we refer to as an exponential curve right here. Right? So that small changes down at this end will typically lead to large changes in the amount of oxygen available to bind to the hemoglobin. So if you get all the way down to 20 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of oxygen, that the there's only about 30 percent all right so look at this from 40 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen to 20 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen you go from 75 percent bound oxyhemoglobin down to 30 percent huge drop for only a 20 millimeter of mercury pressure difference partial pressure of oxygen difference so why is this important? Well, this is important when we look at it from the standpoint of um, uh, pulmonary obstruction disorders, things like asthma, um, that can actually uh, decrease the amount of pressure beyond the blockage within the lungs, um, or things like COPD, right? um, that, or pneumonia that goes ahead and has an effect on the bronchioles, the diameter of the, bron the, the, diameter of the bronchioles or the production of surfactant um, that will go ahead and kind of help to uh, uh, help in the process of gas exchange within the alveoli. So this is critical, right? This is critical. Um, this relationship between oxygen and hemoglobin is designed to conserve oxygen and keep it bound to hemoglobin. Now, all of this goes out the window when we start to talk about carbon dioxide, because this is truly the villain within the story. Right, so, as, and I'm going to make one little um, adjustment here, because um, this is more of a matter of perception. Right, so, let me come back over to the pen. Um, not when pH rises, right, but when pH drops. In other words, when we become more acidic, right, when we become more acidic. So, if CO2 builds up in the body, and another, so let's say high metabolism, low respiration. Right? So your cells are producing a lot of carbon dioxide through um, doing the Krebs cycle, because that's where the that's where the majority of the carbon dioxide is produced through cell respiration. Lots of carbon dioxide being pumped out, but your respiration rate is not increased. Carbon dioxide is going to build up. It's going to build up within the plasma. It's got to go someplace. Um, at CO2 is an acid, it can actually decrease the pH, and it doesn't take much to decrease pH. Um, and so you enter into a state of acidosis. Now, acidosis can cause um, confusion, it can cause um, dizziness, it can cause immune suppression, it can cause nervous system suppression. Um, you can slip into, pass out, and basically go into a coma if that pH drops too low. And remember, and this is key, this is, this is important. This goes back to lecture one or two on the respiratory system. CO2 is more soluble than oxygen. And so there's this affinity to go ahead and have carbon dioxide in the plasma because we want to get rid of it. We want to get that stuff out. And so it's a good thing it's more soluble. We can get it into the plasma and keep it moving. Um, the challenge is, the challenge is what happens when we have too much carbon dioxide? Well, there's a few ways that the body goes ahead and deals with carbon dioxide. 70% um, of the CO2 that is produced is actually uh, converted into carbonic acid. All right. That's what you see right there. H2CO3 is carbonic acid. Uh, and it's actually done uh, through a 
enzymatic reaction using oops sorry using carbonic hydrolase right, anhydrase sorry carbonic anhydrase so carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme that will go ahead and drive the formation of um, this bicarbonate ion now the reason why this is important is because what we're doing is we're using carbon dioxide as an acid to create a buffer bicarbonate is a buffer right? it's a buffer so 70 percent of the carbon dioxide that we go ahead and um, we give off as a byproduct of cellular respiration is actually used as a buffer to go ahead and resist changes in pH within the blood. Um, and, and that's good because there's other things that can drive a drop in pH. Hydrogen ions being released into the blood. Hydrogen ions in high concentration, as you know, based off of definition of an acid, right? um, an acid is a proton donor. Right. Um, so if you have an excess of hydrogen ions, which is a proton, then you're going to drive the pH down. And so we can use carbon dioxide to go ahead and be created into bicarbonate. And that bicarbonate can buffer the hydrogen ions to prevent rapid changes in pH. Um, and so this is good. Right. This is good. By the way, um, alkalosis is if uh, you have uh, too much of a change in pH where the pH becomes more basic, right? So um, alkalosis is another, uh, another, al right. alkalosis is another um, condition that you've got to be aware of. I mean, alkalosis is the pH is too high, it's, it's too base. Um, acidosis is when that pH drops too low. Right, that's when that uh, pH drops too low. So, 23% um, of the uh, the carbon dioxide will actually bind to hemoglobin, um, and when it does that, it forms a, a carb a carb amino hemoglobin, uh, and this is this is very bad um, because carb amino uh, hemoglobin actually forces oxygen off of hemoglobin, so it forces the disassociation of oxygen from hemoglobin. Right. Um, and so the, uh, the carb amino hemoglobin will actually bind to amino acids. It will bind to amino acids uh, on the hemoglobin and force the oxygen off of the heme group. And that is something that we do not want to see. So to counter that, to counter that, we actually have what we refer to as a chloride shift. So we can actually take the carbon dioxide that may be absorbed into the red blood cell. Right? We can take that carbon dioxide, right? knock it off of the hemoglobin molecule, kick it out, Here's that carbon dioxide. Right? It was bound to hemoglobin. Right? We can kick that out, put it back into the plasma, right? and at the same time, right? at the same time, um, we will then go ahead and pump chlorine. Right? We'll pump chlorine out as well. Right? Uh, and the reason why we do that. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah, the reason why we do that is to keep a balance of the ions, right? Because you don't want to throw off the internal environment of the red blood cell. And so we move the chloride ion uh, to go ahead and maintain uh, ionic balance because you're also playing with a change in carbonic acid. I, um, or bicarbonate, sorry. You're also dealing with a change in bicarbonate as well. Um, so you're actually decreasing the amount of bicarbonate that's available. All right. 
and this here would be just the opposite. So when you're creating more bicarbonates right, and you're allowing for more oxyhemoglobin to develop, again, you're kicking off the O2, right? you're throwing off the ion balance, and so then we're going to move the chlorine into just to help maintain the ionic balance that is going on. Um, and so this here just basically goes ahead and, and explains what I was just referring to, that when carbon dioxide binds to that hemoglobin, that carbon amino hemoglobin, uh, we actually force unloading of oxygen. Um, and that is not what we want. Okay, so we really only have uh, a couple more slides left. All right. Uh, this here, these next two slides, just kind of shows the effect of both pH and temperature on oxygen's ability to stay bound to hemoglobin. And so, again, 7.4 is normal. Right? If we drop pH, sorry, if we drop pH, we drop pH to the acidic range, notice that the affinity or the ability for oxygen to stay bound to hemoglobin decreases. So we're kicking oxygen off, right? We might be wasting that oxygen. In other words, low metabolism, you might not need all of that oxygen displaced. Um, on the flip side, right, if that pH increases, becomes more alkaline, then there's a higher degree of oxygen that stays bound, right? um, which means now you're not releasing enough oxygen into the tissues, and so the tissues are going to be starving, um, which is also not good. So um, here we are increasing percentage of oxyhemoglobin, right? and then on this side we are decreasing the percentage of oxyhemoglobin. Uh, both of these are bad given the particular circumstances. Right? Here you're wasting oxygen because you're unloading it for no reason. Here you're conserving it when you probably actually need to be releasing it, and there's a resistance against doing that. And this slide here simply shows us temperature. Right? It shows us temperature. Um, you can see uh, as temperature increases, uh, the affinity for oxygen to disassociate from the hemoglobin increases. The colder the body is, the more that that oxygen wants to be retained and, and stays on the oxyhemoglobin. Um, and then uh, we have 2,3-biphosphoglycerate. Uh, um, this is something that the uh, what we abbreviate as being PBG. Um, red blood cells uh, produce biphosphoglycerate um, as a byproduct of glycolysis. And uh, what this does is it basically binds to one of the two beta chains on hemoglobin, and it forces oxygen to unload from the heme group because we're going to need oxygen in supply during um, the electron transport chain portion of um, cellular respiration. So during glycolysis, we're creating uh, PBG, 2,3-biphosphoglycerate, right? and 2,3-biphosphoglycerate uh, is then um, binding to the beta chains on hemoglobin to force the unloading of oxygen. So that oxygen can then be a proton acceptor during um, the electron transport chain at the end of that process of cellular respiration. And again, this is just a review of um, alkalosis and acidosis, which we kind of already touched on. And then this last slide is a, uh, another animation for you to go ahead and click on. 
and you can watch that on your own. You have that slide. And so uh, respiratory system is done. Um, it is complete. And so uh, the next time that you uh, watch a video, it will be on the digestive system. Uh, and so with that, I invite you to watch this, answer your questions, uh, shoot me um, any questions that you may have. And again, I do want your feedback on this. Um, so do you like this? Is it working for you? Where can I improve? Um, what modifications and changes can I make? And so on that note, um, I will steal a line from Jimmy Fallon, and I will see you on the flippity flop.